Fear and Trembling by Soren Kierkegaard Problema 2 The ethical is the universal and as such is also the divine. Thus it is proper to say that every duty is essentially duty to God. But if no more can be said than this, then it is also said that I actually have no duty to God. The duty becomes duty by being traced back to God. But in the duty itself, I do not enter into relation with God. For example, it is a duty to love one's neighbor. It is a duty by its being traced back to God. But in the duty, I enter into relation not to God, but to the neighbor who I love. If in this connection I then say that it is my duty to love God, I am actually pronouncing only a tautology. Inasmuch as God, in a totally abstract sense, is here understood as the divine, that is the universal, that is the duty. The whole existence of the human race rounds itself off as a perfect self-contained sphere, and then the ethical is that which limits and fills at one and at the same time. God comes to be an invisible vanishing point, an impotent sort. His power is only in the ethical which fills all of existence. In so far then as someone might wish to love God, in any other sense than this, he is a visionary, is in love with a phantom, which if it only had just enough power to speak, would say to him, I do not ask for your love, just stay where you belong. In so far as someone might wish to love God in another way, this would be as implausible as the love Rousseau mentions, whereby a person loves the Kaffirs instead of loving his neighbor. In Hegelian philosophy, the outer, the externalization, is higher than the inner. Recent philosophy has allowed itself simply to substitute the immediate for faith. If that is done, then it is ridiculous to deny that there has always been faith. This puts faith in the rather commonplace company of feelings, moods, idiosyncrasies, vagaries, etc. If so, philosophy may be correct in saying that one ought not to stop there, but nothing justifies philosophy in using this language. Only when the individual has emptied himself and the infinite, only then has the point been reached where vice can break through. The paradox of vice then is this that the single individual is higher than the universal that the single individual determines his relation to the universal by his relation to the absolute. 
not his relation to the absolute by his relation to the universal. The paradox can be expressed thus. There is an absolute duty to God for in this relationship of duty the individual relates himself as the single individual absolutely to the absolute in this connection to say that it is a duty to love God means something different from the above for if this duty is absolute, then the ethical is reduced to the relative. From this, it does not follow that the ethical should be invalidated. Rather, the ethical receives a completely different expression, a paradoxical expression, such as, for example, that love to God may bring the knight of faith to give his love to his neighbor. An expression opposite to that which, ethically speaking, is duty. If this is not faith, then faith has no place in existence. Then faith is, is a spiritual trial, and Abraham is lost in as much as he gave into it. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke fourteen twenty six. The theological student learns that these words appear in the New Testament and in one or another exegetical resource book. He finds the explanation that to hate in this passage and a few other passages by weakening means love less, esteem less, honor not, account as nothing. The, the context in which these words appear, however, does not seem to affirm the appealing explanation. In the verse following this, we are told that someone who wants to erect a tower, first of all, may, may makes a rough estimate to do if he is able to finish it, lest he be mocked later. The close proximity of this story and the verse seems to indicate that, that the words are to be taken in their full terror in order that each, each person may examine himself to see if he can erect the building. Anyone who believes that it is fairly easy to bury the single individual can always be sure that he is not in their face. For fly by night and itinerant geniuses are not men in the face. On the contrary, this night no 
knows that it's glorious to belong to the universal. He knows that it's beautiful and beneficial to play the circle individual who translates himself into the universal. The one who sold the spike personally produces a trim clean and as far as possible faultless edition of himself readable by all. He knows that is it refreshing to become understandable to himself in the universal in such a way that he understands it. And every single individual who understands him in turn understands the universal in him and both rejoice in the security of the universal. The true knight of faith is a witness, never a teacher, and therein lies his deep humanity, which is worth a good deal more than their silly participation in others' weal and woe, which is honored by the name of sympathy, whereas in fact it is nothing but vanity. What did Abraham accomplish for the universal? Let me speak humanly about it, purely humanly. It takes him 70 years to have the son of old age. It takes him 70 years to get what others get in a hurry and enjoy for a lifetime. Why? Because he is being tested and tempted, is it not madness? But Abraham had faith, and only Sarah vacillated and got him to take Hagar as concubine. But this is also why he had to drive her away. He receives Isaac. Then, once again, he has to be tested. He knows that he is glorious to express the universal, glorious to live with Isaac. But this is not the task. He knows that he is kingly to sacrifice a son like this to the universal. He himself would have found rest therein, and everybody would have rested approvingly in his deed as a vow rests in a quiescent letter. But that is not the task. He is being tested. That Roman commander, widely known by his nickname, Conctador, stopped the enemy by his delaying tactics. In comparison with him, what a procrastinator Abraham is. But he does not save the state. This is the content of 130 years. Who can endure it? Would not his contemporaries, if such may be assumed, have said, What an everlasting procrastination this is! Abraham finally received a son it took long enough, and now he wants to sacrifice him? Is he not mad? If, if, he, if he at least could explain why he wants to do it, but it's always an ordeal. Nor could Abraham explain further, 
for his life is like a book under divine confiscation and never becomes public property. And as insectarians go arm in arm with one another, they are totally ignorant of the solitary spiritual trials that are in store for the night of face, and that he dares not flee precisely because it would be still more dreadful if he presumptuously forced his way forward. The sectarians deafen one another with their noise and clamor, keep anxiety away with screeching. A hooting carnival crowd like that thinks it is assaulting heaven, believes it is going along the same path as the Knight of Faith, who in the loneliness for the universe never hears another human voice, but walks alone with his dreadful responsibility. Therefore, either there is an absolute duty to God, and if there is such a thing, it is the paradox just described that the single individual as the single individual is higher than the universal. And as the single individual stands in an absolute relation to the absolute, or else faith has never existed because it has always existed, or else Abraham is lost. Or one must interpret the passage in Luke 14 as did that appealing exeget and explain the similar and corresponding passages in the same way.